There it is, all right. I'm gonna wait one sec. Doesn't seem to be working, clicker. All right. Vocal, stubborn, entitled, cynical, unfocused, lazy, resistant, unpolished. If you're wondering what the common thread is between these words, these are all pulled from headlines about Gen Z. Things that people associate with this generation. Hi, I'm Jay-Z, not Gen Z. <laughs> and today, I want to challenge these associations because I think they're misconceptions. I'm gonna to talk to you about how to build for Gen Z. And in particular, I'm gonna emphasize that to build for Gen Z means to build with Gen Z. But before we dive in, who even is Gen Z? Gen Z were born between 1997 and 2012. And while of course there are differences between cultures and geographies, for simplicity, I'm gonna focus on the experiences of America's first digitally native generation. And if I'm being honest, while this topic is super interesting, it's also a little bit intimidating. Why? Because Gen Z's coming of age experience is so different than mine. If I think back to the early 2000s, the world I grew up in was one where you physically had to go to the mall to buy something. And if you didn't know how to get there, you would go on MapQuest and print out your directions, and then you would kind of look at it while you're driving and hope you don't crash. The world I grew up in is one where you would click a button to save what you're working on. And so the number of times that I've lost a chunk of the English paper or the college essay that I was working on brings back bad memories. The world that I grew up in is one where you didn't think twice before you would upload hundreds of photos to Facebook, broadcasting your entire life to the world. And you know, in order to do that, you actually had to use a camera, which by the way, was a different device than your phone, <laughs> and connect your camera to your computer using a cable. I even distinctly remember the first time that I, quote unquote, went online. Back then, the internet felt exciting, like the rules hadn't yet, had yet to be written. But it also felt clunky and a little bit unreliable. And so then, if you fast forward to the 2010s, Gen Z really start to enter the chat at this point. And their experience with technology is radically different from the iPhone to Instagram, from remote work to getting anything and everything delivered to your door in the form of packages, to TikTok and the infinite scroll. Gen Z are coming to age in a world that is defined by hyper-connectivity, hyper-stimulation, and hyper-personalization. They're living in a multi-screen universe where you can FaceTime with a friend in a different country while browsing Instagram and then making an order on Amazon that'll come the next day. They're collaborating in real time and they trust that everything will not only auto-save and auto-update, but also auto-optimize too. And they can access virtually any information Scrolling between feeds that you know, have grocery hauls to chihuahua means to you know, streams of conflict in a country that you've never been to before, to the engagement photos of people that you've never even met. You can see just a microcosm of what that looks like in the clips behind me, 
which I actually asked my Gen Z coworker at Linktree, Maddie, to record a minute scroll of what it looks like to scroll her phone. Oof. And what I've learned from watching Maddie use her phone, because Gen Z has grown up in a world of autosave, where the concept of breaking something is essentially foreign. They expect for technology to have their backs and to endlessly adapt to their needs. And while they trust in technology to anticipate their needs, they are much less trusting of the platforms and the tools that they use. They know that platforms are optimizing for ad revenue. They know that if one product isn't working, they're gonna go ahead and find countless other options instead. And that's completely different how, from how I, or maybe many of you in the audience grew up. It was kind of MapQuest or bus, and if you were really lucky, you had that Garmin device that you'd put on your car dash. I don't know if anyone remembers that. <laughs> and, you know, the only way to get on the internet was actually sitting through that dial-up. Since joining as Linktree CPO last year, this lack of trust is something that I've been thinking a lot about. In occupying some of the most valid, valuable digital real estate on the internet, Linktree is used heavily by Gen Z. But at the same time, it's used by people, SMBs, and organizations that are clearly not Gen Z. And so the questions that I keep coming back to are, how do you evolve an existing product to ensure that it feels intuitive to this digitally native generation? Then, how do you actually hire the right people to set your team up for success? And finally, how do you then bring your product to market in a way that doesn't feel contrived? Let's start with, how do you build a product that's intuitive to Gen Z and yet is still usable and understandable to a less digitally native you know, other population, those who are a little bit less digitally literate? I believe it all comes down to these three principles. Immediacy, flexibility, and authenticity. Let's talk about the first one. Remember how at the beginning of the talk I mentioned entitled and lazy? What Gen Z are really looking for is immediacy. This is because they are used to rapid feedback all the time from someone liking their post seconds after it goes up, to getting the thing that you ordered literally hours from when you ordered it, Gen Z are not used to waiting. TikTok, as a product, does immediacy really well. When you first download the app, the only thing that they ask for is your birthday before landing you in your For You page. They break up the sign-up flow, only prompting you to enable notifications and for your contacts after you've experienced real value. And this immersive full-screen experience, TikTok through this, TikTok has pioneered a way, a new way of engaging with content where the primary action is not to actively search to find, but to passively swipe to discover building trust that the algorithm will actually find what's relevant for you. There are very few distractions and that the content takes center stage. And that reduces the cognitive load, the distractions, so you can really focus on the thing in front of you. And so, if immediacy is the aim, what is the actionable takeaway? With the products you build, you need to get out of the way, and get to the point. Your first model experience is critical. Avoid heavily signposted onboarding flows and instead allow users to play with your product as quickly as possible. Produ reduce the time to value by radically stre streamlining your funnel and potentially even inverting it completely. And then only ask for information after users have experienced real value. 
Diving to my second principle, when people say that Gen Z are stubborn or resistant, what they really want is flexibility. Interfaces that enable them to dynamically communicate, document, and play. To be able to explore without consequences and in non-linear ways. Notion is a great example of the shift away from the user adapting to the interface and towards the interface adapting to the user. Where previously software drew the lines, Notion is a blank canvas that enables the user to paint, to use Notion's architecture of configurable, configurable building blocks to build whatever it is they want, from Kanban boards to timelines to tables to just free text. They can build whatever it is, and also the UI then flexes to the user based on what it is they're trying to do. From AI enhancement prompts all the way to contextual editing menus. So what does this all mean? You need to think canvases, not corridors. Don't be afraid to build multiple paths to the same goal. Encourage your users to explore your product and really try things out. And at the same time, it's also important to make sure that the optionality doesn't overwhelm. Because at the end of the day, the moment of delight still has to outweigh the moments of difficulty. Bringing me to my third principle. Rather than cynical or unpolished, Gen Z are demanding authenticity. Because of the sheer access to information that they've grown up with, they are acutely aware of the hidden structures and incentive systems that a lot of the platforms that they use and tools that they use that they deploy. If you follow Gen Z friends or family on Instagram, what you see behind me is actually not surprising, and it looks really different than mine. A lot of these team profiles are empty. A few hundred followers, maybe some story highlights, and zero feed posts. Reflecting the shift from broadcasting to narrowcasting, where interactions happen through ephemeral content and private channels, DMs, close friends share lists, and time-bound content like stories or notes. As you can see behind me, Instagram is just one a new feature that accelerates this loop, prompting you to create a group chat when you mention people in your stories. And so how can you harness the shift from narrow, towards narrowcasting to strengthen authenticity? You do so by creating space for intimate interactions. When it comes to the profile, allow your users to express their identity in a way that feels more fluid, impermanent, ever-evolving, and unconstrained. Okay, maybe now you're thinking, Jay-Z, Immediacy, authenticity, oh, sorry, immediacy, flexibility, authenticity. I get these are the principles to build your product by, but how do you hire the right people to actually bring all of this to life? The first thing you need to do is to hire Gen Z. You know that idea? Yes, I heard that. You know that idea that it's costly to hire young people, that only big companies can afford to invest in training them up? Well, I want to take a moment and challenge this, because I think that Gen Z are really the ones who can teach us. By hiring Gen Z, you can harness their intuitive understanding of digitally native interfaces, of, of digital subcultures, to build a product that feels intuitive and fresh, not cringe, as Maddie would say. I think it's easy to fall into the trap of relentlessly seeking to validate every decision with data. But if you do this, you not only won't be able to iterate rapidly enough and learn rapidly enough, you're also limiting your ability to spark delight by doing something that's a little bit decontextualized or random, kind of like the meme culture that Gen Z is used to. Don't believe me? Take Discord's word for it or rather my friend Dabney's, who is a product of, who's a director of product design there. 
So at Discord, we're building this project that we call internally guilds, which are smaller servers that are publicly discoverable. And we were thinking through how to matchmake people. And one of our designers, who's Gen Z, thought a lot of things we were trying were super cringe. So he proposed this new feature called wildcards, which are generally three blanks, free form fields to describe the vibe of the group. And it really took off. People were using words like cash money, chaotic neutral, princess diaries to describe the group. So people can decide is that the group they want to join. And it really shows how intuitively Gen Z understands the internet and speaks that language, which is so akin to our product at Discord. I love, ex I love this example because I think it really clearly shows how hiring Gen Z is not about teaching them, but it's about them teaching us. But ultimately, hiring Gen Z isn't enough. You need to empower them and support them. And I found that the best way to do this is to pair them with someone with more experience and to create a relationship that is highly complementary. Because experience mixed with fresh perspective, produces outcomes that neither individual would have been able to achieve alone. I've actually had my own experience with this. Remember Maddie? From product to go-to-market to annual planning to all things Linktree, we work on the whole spectrum of things. And our relationship has proven to me just how powerful pairing can be. Even this talk is our shared brainchild. When we riff, we combine pattern matching from my experience with Maddie's digitally native intuition. And just like Dabney, who wouldn't have always been able to clock some of the ideas that her Gen Z designer came up with, I find so many of Maddie's ideas incredibly refreshing. And also, what I'm seeing firsthand, you know that authenticity that I mentioned Gen Z really craves? It doesn't just apply to the products that we build it translates to the working relationships too. Our dialogue is open and ongoing. There's no need to say hi or how are you. We riff in real time on anything from product ideas to inspiration to photos of our very different weekends. <laughs> if you can let the formalities and the awareness of hierarchy really fall away, and, and those things were really what defined like earlier generation working relationships. You're able to get to the heart of things, to challenge, challenge each other, and really ensure that the best ideas come out. And speaking of authenticity, this brings me to the final piece of the puzzle. How do you bring market, products to market in a way that doesn't feel contrived? First, you need to co-create with your community by leveraging social channels for rapid feedback. While writing this talk, I talked to Yuki, the CPO of Figma, and he shared something that really stuck with me. Make everything feel like it emanated from the community. Your users are your best source of research, but they're also your best marketing channels. In the same way that Gen Z wants flexibility to be able to choose your, their own adventure in the product, they want to be able to feel like they can shape how the product evolves as well. Figma and the browser company do this incredibly well. By asking for feedback on socials in order to get rapid signal, they make their community feel like they are part of the things that they're building, nurturing a sense of pride that helps mobilize their users into becoming champions and the ultimate advocates of their product. And by pulling back the curtain, they're also showcasing the authenticity that Gen Z craves. Which brings me to my final insight. This is the era where personal over polished reigns. Gen Z sees straight through contrived messaging. With only a subset of older generations knowing how to use something like a Photoshop, it's kind of ironic at this conference, um, Gen Z have grown up with filters, and they don't believe always that what they see is a real thing. And so the content that actually resonates is content that is indistinguishable from organic UGC, things that they're already seeing in their feeds. 
Content that genuinely entertains and sparks interest. Content that doesn't make them feel like they're being sold to. Take this example. Now here are two Instagram reels from the luggage company Away. As you can see, the reel on the, on the left here, it's much more reminiscent of traditional marketing. It's polished, the product is kind of the star of the show. Whereas the reel over here on the right is very different. It's focused on the Away team trying to stuff as many clothes as they can into a suitcase. The product is featured much more organically in this content the same way that you would engage with it if you were on your social media channels. And it helps it feel not so contrived. The editing is, yeah, the editing is also very similar to non-branded content that creators share. And all of this, it helps it make it feel authentic. Like its purpose is to entertain as opposed to promote. And in terms of what resonated, the real on the right got 150 times more views, 3 million compared to 20,000. That is a huge difference. And that is because in today's world, people want personal connection over polished content. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground today. How do you build, how do you hire, and how do you market? Here are six key takeaways. To build for Gen Z, you need to get to the point. Think canvases, not corridors. Create space for intimate interactions. Invest in emerging talent by hiring and pairing with them. Co-create with your community for rapid feedback. And when you bring your product to market, think personal, over-polished. And speaking of co-creation, I'd love to thank this amazing community of product, marketing, and design leaders who have helped me co-create these insights. And actually, there's one last insight that I'd love to share. You may think that today I've given you a talk about how to build for Gen Z. And that I've made the point that to build for Gen Z, you need to build with Gen Z. But what you've probably also realized is that a lot of these insights likely resonate with your expectations too. And that is because at the end of the day, what I've actually just been talking about is how to build great products. Thank you.